It's a blessing to be with you. We are traveling the USA on an Unlocking Evangelism Tour. It's amazing just the testimonies and the things that have been happening. We came into the Hebraic Roots of the Faith and just under four years ago, actually. In fact, it was the end of two, it was Fall Feast of 2012. Our entire world got supernaturally transformed after walking the land for, for one and a half years from June 2011 uh, until the end of 2012, our entire worlds were supernaturally transformed. And it happened because we came to the land and we asked the Father, what are you doing here and how do we become a part of it? Is anyone here familiar with our ministry before? A couple? Okay. Excellent. Well, that's great. Excellent. What we do when we travel as well, we have a broadcast center in the Galilee. Our, our ministry is called God of Life Ministries. Our focus is our project, Bulldoze Our Faith. Uh, we're, like I said, we have a broadcast center. We have a television center on the shores of the Galilee. And our focus is to shine a light from the Galilee to the ends of the earth. We have people come and visit us from all over the world. Most days I get emails of uh, people's schedules of when they're coming. Uh, some people want to come and get mikvahed. Uh, just we, we make for them in the Galilee because uh, we have a, a beach just next to where we are at the, the lower part of the Canaret. But we produce DVDs, we produce things online on YouTube, and we're reaching literally thousands of people with the true gospel of the kingdom. We're witnessing thousands coming out of Christianity especially into the Hebraic roots. Uh, we're even seeing transformation with pastors and leaders, and it's phenomenal, the things that's taken place. Now, I did a, a testimony called, Have We Lost the Love? This is a 58 and a half minute uh, DVD where I share my testimony about coming into the Hebraic roots of the faith. This message is supernaturally transforming lives, especially if you've got family members that think you're in a cult and they think, ah, oh, you've just gone under legalism. You know, we know what you're getting into, and they don't really know what you're getting into. But this DVD, if you sit down and watch this with them and they hear my story coming into Hebrew Roots. I've had testimonies from all over the world of, of families that have been united and restored uh, in the message with their children coming into the Hebrew Roots of the faith. So it's called, Have We Lost the Love? And um, like I said, I share my testimony on there. Then I expand on the testimony on this uh, five-part series called Redeem Israel. The importance of this series is, is uh, the keys that actually brought me into Hebrew Roots. I never heard anyone minister on Hebrew Roots. I never heard anyone teach on it. I was 25 years in ministry, got a doctorate of theology, and I've been preaching internationally for, you know, forever. You know, we've worked on the streets of London with drug rehab in Spain. And uh, when Haley and I got married, uh, you know, it was basically a, a sending out. You know, our wedding gifts were suitcases and stuff for travel. You know, forget the dishwasher, forget the washing machine and all that stuff. It was like, you know, get married under the hooper, then see ya. Go in Yeshua's name. Go. Go into the nations. And uh, on our marriage certificates, our occupation is missionary for me and for my wife. Now, imagine making Aliyah with that on your marriage certificate, huh? And uh, we did. We made Aliyah in Israel. We never got challenged on one thing concerning Yeshua. It was supernatural, all the steps and the things that took place. But we got to Israel. We said, Father, what are you doing here? And how do we become a part of it? Because these were key things the Father taught us. No matter where you go on this earth, no matter where the Father calls you, you always ask the Father what he is doing in those places. You never bring your thing anywhere. You always seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We are called to be his servants. We are called to be his voice wherever the Father has called us. And the first word the Father gave me was, shine a light from the Galilee to the ends of the earth. I didn't even want to live in the Galilee. Uh, I'm, I'm like, why, why do you want me here? I could be in Jerusalem. I could be in a city where people are actually at, you know, instead of being in this little retirement village, uh, Perea Elite, just uh, next to uh, Tiberias. Father, why have you called me here? And I didn't really know the answer, but he said, I want you to shine a light from this location. Then Matthew chapter 4 came alive to me from the land of Zebulun, uh, the area of Naphtali, uh, by the Galilee of the Gentiles. This is the place where Yeshua would come. And I, I didn't know why Yeshua would come there. I would even ask leaders in Hebrew roots. I'd say, what did Yeshua come to the Galilee for? 
And many of them would say, oh, I don't know. But anyway, hey, I found the answer. <laughs> it's exciting. I went to 2 Kings chapter 15, and I found the answer. This was the place where the northern kingdom was deported into Assyria, was in the Galilee. So it makes t sense that Yeshua would come back to the place where they were dispersed from, you know, to redeem the land. The next word the Father gave me was, the land deal is for today, not the millennial kingdom. How many theologians do we have here? Any theologians? Any want to be? No, no one wants to be a theologian. But, you know, if you study the word, if you study the end times, we're really challenged with the scripture, with what things say. I studied Revelation for over five years in the early 90s, and it nearly actually wrecked my life. I got so consumed with studying Revelation. Why? Because I wanted to know the signs of the times. Why did I want to know the signs of the times? So that I could have authority in the end times to deliver the word of Yehovah and make a difference to this generation. That was the reason I was doing it. But every time I studied one author or, or one uh, internationally renowned speaker on the subject, I'd go through all of their series, all of their stuff. I'd get to the end and I would say to the Ruach, is this the truth? And he'd say, nope. I'm like, man. Then I'd go to the next one, go through all of that and watch the cassette or see, listen to the cassettes, watch videos in the old-fashioned days. Is this the truth? No, no, no. For five years, everything I read, I even read a Billy Graham book on storm warnings. Now, you know, I know that would have been pretty far-fetched, looking at Billy Graham for end-time theology, you know. But I thought, I will read anything just to understand the days in which we're living. And he wrote about the year 2000. Oh, it's going to be bad. We'll have no food. The whole world will be in chaos. God, that was 15 years ago. Look, we're all still here. Everything's still okay. Wow, how did that happen? Logic and reason mustn't have worked somehow. Anyway, we go through all these different things trying to work out what time is, what time is it? What day are we living and the father said to me, the land deal is for today, not the millennial kingdom. He said, this is the most important word you must understand. And I thought, what does that mean? He took me to Genesis chapter 15, the covenant of Abraham about the land and about his descendants. The covenant that is cut between Yehovah and the Messiah. They cut the covenant as Abram is asleep. It's an incredible portion of Scripture. It's a promise that hasn't yet seen its fulfillment or its fullness. The land deal is for today, not the millennial kingdom. I didn't understand it. I've only been studying it now for four years. And the more I study it, the more I go over this, the more my world is being supernaturally transformed. I have debates uh, with people who, who understand end times and who are teaching on end times. I challenge them. I go through all of their arguments. I, I, I get in their face on every point. And I say, if you can't take your idea all the way back and make it fit all the way through Scripture, you must lay it down. You cannot stand on it. If, if you find a crack in it somewhere, you must lay it down. The land deal is for today, not the millennial kingdom. This was the key word that brought me into the Hebraic roots. Here we are in the land in preparation to make Aliyah. We are going through the process to get our citizenship in the land. And the Father said, if you want to understand the importance of the land deal today, not in the millennial kingdom, study the return of my people. I'm not in Hebrew roots. I've never heard a Hebrew roots teacher. I was in the organic expression of faith. I, I talked to Christians outside of institutional Christianity and taught them, you know, get paganism out of your Christian experience. And then in 2007, the Father says, you don't do Christmas anymore. The Father was doing a preparation in our hearts as we were untangling from these pagan feasts and these pagan ways. And we didn't keep the feasts. We didn't know about the Shabbat, truly. We would keep the Shabbat, or so we thought, on the Sunday. And then as we're walking the land, as we're going through the process, the Father says, keep my Sabbath. And then he said, start looking at the feast, go through the feast. But the thing that really got a hold of my life that brought transformation was studying the return of his people. Why, why is this important towards unlocking destiny, it's very, unlocking evangelism? It's very important because if we are going to share the true gospel of the kingdom, we've got to understand the, the gospel 
And yes, we don't have to be so complicated. We don't have to go in and do the breakdown of the 46 armpit hair of the false messiah. You know, we don't need to get into that detail. We just need to know the flow. We just need to understand the process of what the Father is doing. So that's a five-part series where I open up the basis level of my testimony of the land deal being for today. Uh, I also have another one called Supernatural Transformation. You know one thing I'm fed up with? We've got people in Hebrew roots, and we go around, and they are, they are scared stiff of the Ruach HaKodesh. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll tell you everything about the feast and everything about the commandments, but when it comes to the Spirit, nothing's happening. Where is the life of the Spirit? Where is the action of the Spirit? Don't tell me we've got the commandments and we're getting back to the roots of our faith if we deny the very keys that Yeshua said, this is what you need. I am going away. I'm going to leave the counselor with you, the Ruach HaKodesh. He will remind you of everything I have said. He will show you what is to come. You can't live this life without the Spirit. And I travel around the country, and many leaders say to me, why do we not have the life? What is in the way? And I truly believe it's because we've developed traditions of Judaism. We're developing another system. Why? Because man loves knowledge. There's two trees in the garden, the garden of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. But some people think it's just the garden of uh, evil, uh, but the knowledge of evil, it's the knowledge of good too. People get addicted to knowledge. They, they feel more settled in the realm of logic and reason. Logic and reason is the enemy of the kingdom. So in this three-part series on supernatural transformation, it's a prophetic message to wake people up, to charge them in the spirit, to come alive. Don't just have a Torah. Don't just say you've got the feasts all worked out, but you don't have the life of the spirit. If we don't know his voice... You can keep all the commandments. If you don't know his voice, you have no part of him. We have no part of him. Hallelujah. So we need to know his voice. We need to be walking in accordance with his will because this is not about you making a logical decision. Oh, God is real through logic and reason. No, we need to know him. We need to be in fellowship with him and be charged and infused with the Ruach HaKodesh. So that's what this DVD is about here. Then the last one I want to share with you is the Jonah Quadrilogy. I don't break this down like other teachers break it down. This is a prophetic release of the four chapters of Jonah. You know, there was no alternative for the fulfillment of the, pro of, of the prophetic word that was given to Jonah. He was the only man that could do it. I want to ask a question. What if in your life you're the only person that can do it and the Father has no alternative? We were all born for a purpose. Before the creation of the earth, the Father knew who you were. He knew what you were called to do. Are we walking in His will and in His purpose? Are we going through tough times and challenges because we are out of place and we're missing the very calling that we are called to walk in? We're not called to do things because we can, and this is our natural gifting, and this is who we are. Just look at Gideon when the angel came. What was he doing? He was making some bread. And the angel comes down, his GPS, you know, Waze or something he was using, or Google Maps. Boom, he arrives. He's like, hey, you mighty man of war. And Gideon's like, man, God, have you not seen my latest Facebook, Facebook page, uh, post, you know? Don't you know I'm making some bread here in a wine press? You know, we're scared stiff down here. I'm the least of the least. You've got the wrong address. The angel didn't say, I love the way you're making bread. Let's start Gideon and Co. International Bread Making Company. That's not what happened. We've got to wake up and realize the very things the Father has called you to do might have nothing to do with your natural talent and your natural ability. The things that the Father has called us to do will be to take us out of our realm, out of our comfort zone. He, he, he has a plan for every one of our lives that's way beyond the capacity of anything we can do. We have got to get out of control and be okay with that. Hey, man? Yeah. So the Jonah Quadrilogy, see, every time I share about that, I start preaching anyway. You know, I just get so excited. I talk about uh, the importance of those things in that series of DVDs. We've got these packs with us tonight. You can buy them individually, but if you buy them as a pack, it's $100, and you get the Jonah Quadrilogy, a four-part series for free. Uh, so that's going to be there as well. Uh, just before we start as well, I want to share with you what it's like being in the land of Israel. Many people get to visit the land and it's, wow, 
This is amazing. It must be awesome living in Israel. Really cool. Man, just waking up in that realm and the Bible place. And, you know, there's moments, yes. But I tell you what, the spiritual warfare that we face in the land, we've ministered around uh, many nations. And I'm telling you that the hardest place we've ministered is in the land of Israel. The oppositions that we are facing, the challenges that we face, the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in, is incredible. There's a lot of prayer and work that needs to get done for us to even break through in any realm. And people come and they can't believe the things that we've accomplished. We walked into Israel with a bag with nowhere to stay and with no resources, and we prayed. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to pray. The first thing we have to establish is, Father, what are you doing? When we establish that, what's he doing? He is planting vision in our hearts for his purpose. Where there's vision, there comes forth provision. We've launched a Hebrew learning center. We have three and a half thousand people learning Hebrew through our, our, the Hebrew Lesson Challenge. It's hebrew-lessons.com. If you want to learn Hebrew, we have cards over there. Three and a half thousand. We had the government, Ministry of Absorption. They came up to our offices and our studios, and they were just walking around going, Baruch Hashem, and weeping and thinking, this is incredible. You people are new olim. You're just new immigrants. Look at the things you are doing here in the land. And it was all to His glory what's happening. They turned around and said, can we give you land? I'm like, absolutely. But if you're talking about a couple of little dunas, you know, a few acres, I've just got to make sure we're on the right page. I need enough land to put in over 60 offices, a thousand-seater auditorium production center room, and I must have enough land just in case I need to put up a few hotels just to handle the traffic that we're going to bring into the Galilee. If you're talking about that much land, then we're talking on the right channels. They're like, we'll give you that today in the Golan Heights. I said, no, I want it right down here in the Jordan Valley next to the Galilee. That might be a little harder, but we'll just need to think about that. How can we work together? Thank you, Father. That's what it's all about. It's about making a difference. It's, it's difficult in the land. Why? Because many people in the land are set in their ways, especially the Mercianic community. They're against those that teach the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Mercianic Jews in the land are very protective over the ministries that function in the land, and they get very upset when they see people coming in that are, that are telling the Gentiles in the West, you're not Gentiles. You're called to be Israel. You're called to be grafted in. Do you know your identity? These are key things that we share, and you know what? I know that we're starting to make an impact because the fourth largest a nation that watches us on YouTube is Israel. Hallelujah. So in the midst of all the persecution and all the things people say, it's encouraging more people to go on and watch our videos and our presentations and broadcasts online. So that's what it's all about, is that people can get the message and they can understand the message. We have Jews, religious Jews, come uh, to our office and they come and they sit down and they say, tell me about Yeshua. I'm like, pardon, <laughs> you know? And as I'm sharing with them, they say, oh, don't tell me your testimony. We've already watched 20 hours of you on YouTube yeah, or with other testimonies. Tell me about Yeshua. And then I start opening up the Scriptures and showing them Yeshua from the, the, the Torah. Everything's coming alive, and you just watch them. And some of them say, I don't know why. I'm just sitting listening to what you're saying, and I just want to weep. Why do I want to weep? I said, because you have a void in your life. You need to receive the Messiah. You need to renounce Judaism. Yes, that's right. I'm one of those people. I don't say to the Orthodox Jews or the Jews in the land, Hey, I'm your brother. I'm Ephraim. You are Judah. No. I say Judah is in Messiah. Ephraim is also in Messiah. Prophecy is being fulfilled. I will die for the Jews in the land of Israel. But the only way we're going to see transformation in the land of Israel, if we tell them, you're out of covenant. You're in rebellion. I was also out of covenant. I was also in rebellion. I have received the Messiah. He is the living branch from the root of Jesse. He is the Netzer. There is no other blanch. That's why he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. It wasn't because he was setting up a new religion. It's because he was the only living branch coming out of the root of Jesse. And we are all grafted into the Messiah. 
Hallelujah. That's the only connection. It was there with Mary and Joseph. It was there with Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were also following Torah, walking in his ways and had a pure heart and walking in the right spirit. But they're dead today. Then the only way for us to be in covenant is through the Messiah. And I, I say to people that that's why we should accept the Messiah, because he is saying that, that he is one with Yahovah. He is not saying there's another way. There is only one way. Hallelujah. I think it's in uh, the book of Jeremiah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I haven't got my portable electronic Bible today, so I've got to try and work out what everything is again. Isn't that weird, huh? It's in Jeremiah 32, verse 39. And I shall give them one heart and one way. That's the key testimony of what Yeshua was talking about when he says that he is the way. He is the only way to the Father. Hallelujah. So we get the privilege now of starting to minister to the Orthodox. We're ministering to the religious Jew. In fact, I had um, one of the uh, orange, uh, they, they do the broadband and cell phones in Israel. For those of you who have been to Israel, one of their senior account managers came up from Tel Aviv to see me because we have a microwave dish for broadcasting. And he came up and he's sitting talking to me. He says, oh, I'm an atheist. My, my family is Orthodox, but I'm an atheist. And then he asked me, he said, tell me about the Messiah. Tell me, talk to me. I started to share with him, started to break it down. I get to the end after half an hour of just sharing with him. You know what happens? He says, you have totally transformed the way I think. I have never had anyone open up the scriptures like you just have done. And he said, I can no longer walk out of here being an atheist. I said, you must renounce the way you have walked. You must teshuvah, turn around, come back to Torah. The very same message that Yohanan ben Zechariah delivered. Repent, teshuvah, come back to Torah. Come back to the living word. Hallelujah. <coughs> they leave challenged. It's not our job to try and close the deal. It's not our job to force people into decisions. It's our job to plant the seed and allow the Ruach to water those seeds. Because if it's true, they're going to come alive. They're going to just flourish and come alive. So it's exciting being in the land of Israel because we are seeing fruit. We are seeing testimonies. But there's a few things I wanted to, to hit on today when it comes to uh, unlocking evangelism and some of the keys that I use. Because here we are, we come out of the Christian world, come into the Hebrew roots. How do we witness? Huh? <laughs> when you're talking to someone on the street, repent. Ask Jesus into your heart, repent of your sins. You're going to have eternal life and live in heaven. That's not going to work anymore, is it? <laughs> so what do we do? How do we minister to people? How do we prepare people for evangelism? And as I've traveled around, uh, especially America, you know, I've done about three or four national tours, some for four months, three months, literally traveled all over the nation. And just the last trip I spoke at 80 meetings in 90 days across the country, drove 18,000 miles. And in that trip, that's when everything just started to really wake up. I saw the, the scale of the need. I traveled the nation, and I asked the Father, how ripe is this nation for the true gospel? How ripe is it? If we don't have reports, every person in the Hebrew roots I was speaking to, or the majority of those I was speaking to, not all, the majority, they'd say, I don't share my faith anymore. Why? Because I keep losing friends. No one wants to talk to me at work. No one wants to relate to me. Every time I share, phew, that's it. I'm losing all my friends. So why even bother sharing? Why bother? And they've lost the will to share. And then they hear my reports. Everywhere I go, every step I'm taking, we're seeing people turn to Torah. Even in the restaurant today, we stop. And I know what, how much time we've got. Uh, we've got 45 minutes so we can get here and plenty of time. And then what happens? Uh, you know, we walk in, a person recommends a soup as we're standing there, and his wife comes over to talk to us at the end, and she's been to Bible school, and we just asked a few simple questions. Do you really know what the true gospel is? And just started to share. Wow, she was so hungry. I got to pray for her. She was sick. Uh, she had problems with her nerve systems. It was so wide open. We sat there sharing for 40, well, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. How long? An hour? 
an hour and a half. It, the hunger and thirst that is in the hearts of the people as you start to share. We have been told lies. Our Father have told us lies. Here is the truth. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever wondered why Christmas and Easter isn't in the Bible? What are you talking about? Well, we actually know the day he was born. They're hiding it from you, but it's already been revealed. We know it was the first day of Sukkot, the first day of Tabernacles. We know because on the eighth day, which is also known as the last great day, that was the day the Messiah was named, hallelujah, and he was circumcised. Hallelujah. We know the dates. We know the time. Oh, well, we just celebrate it on the 25th of December because no one knows the day. No one knows the time. And we get to share, and you see people come alive. You see them. There's nothing more joyful than seeing people wake up. Amen? It's transforming. It's transforming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit on a couple of points that people might disagree. So we'll do that and get that over with at the, this stage. <laughs> I, love, I love doing stuff like this. Um, not that I'm trying to make p people disagree. I just want to challenge our thinking. I want to challenge our mindset on why do we believe the things that we believe. The Father said the land deal is for today, not for the millennial kingdom. And I'm just lifting my hands in the air. Why? He says, you study the return of my people and this revelation will become a living reality to you. Deuteronomy chapter 30 starts to break down and starts to show us about the return of the people from all of the nations. It is not addressing just Judah. It's addressing the whole house of Israel. I found in over a thousand sections of Scripture, I found on the return of His people. In fact, the majority of the Tanakh is about the return of His people when we really look into it. I went over a thousand sections and broke them down. And then I recognized in those a thousand sections, over 170 of those sections talked about Judah and Ephraim independently in the same portion of Scripture. We're going to look at one of them right now. It's found in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Like I said, over 170 of these scriptures just came alive. Verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of Yahovah will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahovah. And he will delight in the fear of Yahovah. Hallelujah. Who's that? Who's that talking about? Yeshua, yeah. Has that come to pass? Yeah, it's come to pass. I'd say pretty much everything we're seeing there has come to pass. But then we come to the next section and we go, oh, wait a second, has this bit come to pass? One thing I want to say to you that's different, when we start looking at the books of prophecy, what you'll see is you could be reading in a chapter, and one bit of the chapter has come to pass, another bit hasn't come to pass, then you come across another bit that has come to pass, and you're like, goodness me, couldn't you do this in chronological order or something? You, know, you get to Isaiah 61, and Yeshua's talking about who he is, right? And he, can, he only gets to read just a couple of verses, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because Yehovah has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Hallelujah. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year, not the three and a half year, of Yehovah's favor, and the day... Oh, sorry. Pause. Yep. I was going to continue reading. This is what happens as we start reading uh, the prophetic books. There's sections that have come to pass, sections that haven't come to pass. Everything seems to be quite mixed up, and we've got to slowly go through things to understand what is being said, because what we just read there was the first coming. The next element is the second coming of the Messiah. Hallelujah. These things are all joined together, and it's the very same as what we're seeing here in Isaiah chapter 11. We go into verse 3, uh, the second part. He will not judge, oh, I forgot to say, if we're reading the King James, of course, the numbers would have really mattered, wouldn't they? <laughs> Sorry, I'll just go back to reading now, okay. <laughs> he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes 
or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will, he will give decisions to the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be in his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion will yield, will yield uh, and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and the young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hands into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yehovah as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled. The earth will be filled. We go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Keep your finger in there. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, just in case there's any Christians showed up, you know. <clears throat> they might not believe what's written in the, in the other section there. It says in verse 11, it says, No longer will a man teach his neighbor or his brother say, No, Elohim, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Interesting that that's in the whole portion talking about the renewed covenant with Judah and with Israel. When are all these things going to come to pass? These are the big questions. You know, I found that there's a, you know, on your computer, you have a thing called trash sort of down the bottom side on your PC or your Mac, you know. And you throw things in trash. And then you set yourself up little folders, you know. You just throw things into folders that you're trying to clear. I call it like desktop. And then I put the year, you know, 2015. And I'm like always flinging stuff into desktop, just trying to keep my desktop clean. So when people look at my computer, they think I've got it all together. But really, I've got 6 million things in desktop 2015. In the scriptures, the theologians, when they don't understand it, they just fling it in the millennial kingdom. Oh, look, I don't know where that goes. Oh, throw it in the millennial. Ah, that'll be fine. Fling it over there. Yeah. The question is, when are all these things going to happen? What was the example of the kingdom of earth? It was, the, it was the first exodus. Hallelujah. Here they are. They are witnessing supernatural transformation. How many people came out of Egypt? Two million, 1.3 million, some have said. Million. There was a multitude of others that joined them. I think maybe it's about 1.3 million. I think that, that's probably what I've heard more often. I might be wrong. Um, all those people came out, right? No one had cell phones, right? They didn't have those uh, houses set up like where to put the Jews or the Israelites on the process to help them get back to the land. You know, a little feeding station, you know. There was no one down near the Red Sea said, oh, you know, I just have this prophetic vision. I think I'll build a barn for 1.5 million people and store enough food when they come through so we can feed them. None of those things happened. It just, they, they just had the Passover. The next thing they know, boom, they're on the road. They're getting the plunder for the Egyptians, and they're heading out. It wasn't meant to take them that long to get into the land. And they're just trucking out. They get to the Red Sea, and they're like, oh, goodness me. Man, that chap, Moses, is he crazy? Did he bring us out here to die? They're all in fear and terror. They didn't understand. They're like, Moses, did you not have it all together? Did you not get the, the highway division, get them all sorted, do some tarmac, build a bridge over the Red Sea, make it nice and wide, and put like tasers on the end so when the Egyptians come, we can taser them. Oh, a couple of tanks, let's just blow them all away. Didn't you got all these plans organized? No, they're standing at the Red Sea, and the Red Sea's closed, and the Egyptians are coming behind them, and there's no hope. There's no way of escape. There's no previous testimony other than the, the deliverance of the ten plagues. Moses says, hey, you watch what's about to happen here. And Yahovah says, Moses, why are you crying out to me? What's in your hand? What? The staff, the, his rod of testimony, the very works of Yahovah are in his hand, the markings on his stick of the great things that he has done. He said, stretch out your hand, and that sea opens up. And I'm telling you, we just walked in to the kingdom on earth. We just walked into a new dimension. There's no logic and reason involved. 
There's no calculations. Don't sit down and work out how high the walls need to be at each side so the people can walk through. How wide should we make this? Oh, Moses, should we make this like 40 feet wide, 100 feet wide? One mile wide. No one's doing the calculations. Why? It's totally out of our realm. I truly believe as we start to witness the true dynamics of the second exodus, the true second exodus that's coming, it's not on the basis of logic and reason. I have people challenge me, what do you mean the land deals for today? It has to be when Messiah returns because the, the Messiah has to do so many things in Scripture. It says that he has to do it, and this is my response. So who's in charge right now? Is Yeshua not in charge? Is he not the head of the Kela? Is he not the head of the body? You think he's sitting up there smoking Cuban cigars and drinking a glass of, uh, well, you know, Mayim, <laughs> heavenly Mayim? No. He knows strategically everything that's happening. Why? Because every one of us are being led by the Spirit, or we're meant to be. The Spirit is reminding us of everything that the Messiah said. He's showing us what's to come. The problem we have when it comes to how are these things going to work, what if the lion, what if the wolf will live with the lamb, what if the, the lion and, and the, the calf Yearlings will be together and the children will lead them. What if that happens and it's before the Messiah returns? <sighs> oh, that's not logic and re that's not logical. What happens if we have a hundred million people that have to return to the land of Israel before the Messiah returns? Well, you might need a hundred plus uh, not even if you had a hundred years, it's not enough time. What are you going to do with the road structure? Where are you going to house them? Where are you going to get the water? How, you know, and it, here comes the million questions of the logic and reason and how all these things are going to happen. And you know, my response is, well, how many came out of Egypt? Say it's 1.3 million. Say there's 100 million that's meant to return. All you need to do is split them into groups of 100 and you've got the same timeline. What's the problem here? Don't we have airplanes? How many people fly every day? Goodness me, what's our problem here? How, how can we bring all these people back to the land? I don't know the answer. The Scripture doesn't say how it's going to happen. I just love the way Yehovah moves. So many of us are trying to work it out. Has theologians ever got things sorted for us in the past? Huh? We don't need theologians to tell us what to do. We just need to hear from heaven. It says in James, ask for wisdom, and it will be given to all without Fault, is that right? Without finding fault. Everyone, basically, everyone who asks will be given wisdom. But if you want to be like the wind of the sea, tossed to and fro, if you want to doubt, huh, don't think you'll receive anything from him. The message of the kingdom was the first exodus. It was the demonstration of the kingdom. The, Yeshua says, I want you to pray this prayer. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. This was about the return of his people. Hallelujah. Yeshua said, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is part of our gospel. This is part of the truth. Many of us are trying to work out the end times, the end time structures, what the Scripture says, what the breakdown says, as if you're sitting holding a book of logic and reason. When it says clearly, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, your ways, declares Yahovah. And I want to ask you a question, and all of your working outs and all of your, your uh, presentations and demonstrations of how things are going to happen in the end, I want to ask you a question. Can you lay it all out in logic and reason? If the answer is yes, it's the wrong plan. The more we know, the more we know we don't know. What a bummer, eh? Wouldn't it be great if it was the more we know, the more we understand? The more we know, the more we realize you are an incredible creator of the universe. Yahweh, we worship you. Hallelujah. We can't comprehend you. We can receive the transformation of understanding the Scriptures, of understanding the Word, we have the infant will play near the hole of the cobra, verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 11. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge 
of Yahovah as the water covers the sea. The very promise that's in Jeremiah 31, the very promise we see in Hebrews chapter 8. Hallelujah. So they're coming out of Egypt. Their clothes grow with them. How dare they? Why didn't they have one of those goodwills? Just pass it all down and just recycle, let it all go, make sure they're all wearing linen and everything's going to be fine. Their shoes even grew. Their food came supernaturally. There was no chef's department. They received manna from heaven. Oh, Moses, we've got no water. There's no water bottling company out here. What are we going to do? The Father will provide. You are walking in the kingdom. The exodus, the return, is walking in the kingdom. As we return, it will be walking in the kingdom. The Father says, do we know how to live in the kingdom right here, right now? Wow. I've been walking in the kingdom for over 20 years. I never do a job that the Father hasn't called me to do. I don't take on a contract. I've made some mistakes, actually. I have, yeah. I nearly got killed one time. I employed a guy who was part of an international drug ring. I shared it on Have We Lost the Love. He tried to kill me as I discovered all the money he had been stealing from my company and everything that was going on. And an angel bust into my office and grabbed him, threw him into a headlock, and he was, he was like an American footballer, huge guy, blonde hair. You know, all this thing about blonde-haired angels, it must be true. <coughs> threw him into a headlock. He says to me, go on and break his legs. I'm like, I don't want to break his legs. Then he threw him up against the wall with his feet off the ground, holding his neck. He said, this man's not a fighting man. You want to mess with anyone, you're going to mess with me. And he threw him down three flights of stairs. I had no idea the guy I was firing and the guy that was threatening or just about. He had me through the air. I'm flying through the air. I'm about to go through a third floor window or through the back wall. He had just wrecked all my office. And this angel throws him down three flights of stairs. I didn't know he was part of an international drug ring with contracts on his life and was using my company as a cover. Scotland Yard came and visited me afterwards and said, we just want to tell you about what was going on. When I was walking in to do these major deals and I'm sitting across the table from Scotland Yard and I'm not doing deals with the people or the companies I fought, it was mock-up meetings with Scotland Yard because they're trying to find out, was I part of this ring too? Everything was bugged. <laughs> you know, wow. The kingdom, what is the kingdom? Where is the example of the kingdom? We see it in the book of Exodus. We are being brought out for what purpose? It's all about the marriage. It's all about the preparation of the marriage. Why do I know the land deal is for today? Why are people not teaching this stuff? If we study through and through and through that there has to be an engagement with Judah and Ephraim. Let's keep reading before I get too excited here. Verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 11. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, for his place of rest will be glorious. In that day, Yehovah will reach out his hand a second time and reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from where? Assyria. Hallelujah. Lower Egypt, from the upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, and from Hamath. Some of these names are certainly not out of Scotland. And from the islands. Oh, there's Scotland. Found Scotland. Yep. From the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah. Uh-oh. He's speaking about Israel and he's speaking about Judah. From the four quarters of the earth. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's Enemies will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. <coughs> wow. Here we are witnessing here an incredible presentation of the second exodus. They, then they will swoop down on the slopes of some place, Philistia, uh, to the west. Together they will plunder the people to the east. Now, wait a second. They're going to be fighting. They're going to swoop down. They're going to 
uh, deal with plunder. Why are they going to plunder? Because there is, there is a return, there's a plundering, there's a giving back. We're going to go back into the land with the blessings. We're not going to go in empty-handed. There's going to be a plunder coming to us. They will lay hands on Edom and Moab and the Amorites will be subject to them. Huh. It's amazing. All these things are happening. Don't we know when the, the return of the Messiah comes, when He truly comes, when He conquers Hasatan, when He deals with the false Messiah, we enter into the Shabbat thousand-year rest. Oh, wait a second. I know it's the Shabbat. Let's go have a couple of battles. Let's go try and work out where all the people are. Let's get them all back. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, when you come back to the land, I'll make you more prosperous than your fathers. I'll make you so blessed. All the nations will see your blessing. I'll even come against your enemies. That has to happen. All of Israel have to be in place. They have to be witnessing that. He even talks, I'll bless the work of your hands and the, the fruit of your womb will be prosperous. Who is he speaking to? Israel. When the Messiah returns, the wedding supper of the lambs happened. Let me ask a question. <coughs> Excuse me. Will we be giving in marriage? Will we? Or will we be the bride? It's very interesting. Will we have our heavenly bodies? Are we working on earthly body, earthly bodies? So when they come back, it says they will be having babies. Their womb will be breast. The work of their hands will be breast. Your enemies will be, will be pushed off against you. That's, not, that's before the Messiah returns. And that's all of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 15, Yehovah will dry up the gulf and the Egyptian sea with a scorching wind. He will sweep his hand over Euphrates liver, he, river. He will break it up into seven streams so that man can cross over in sandals. That's why sandals are coming back. I was always wondering why everyone's wearing sandals today. Eh? <laughs> there will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria and there as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. Hallelujah. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from, that is left from Assyria. That's the northern kingdom. That's not Judah. Hallelujah. Anyway, these were some of the key things the Father started to reveal to me. He said, you go and you start studying the Word. Don't you go to any Christian doctrine on end times. Don't you go to any people that are trying to work out through logic and reason. Any person that's trying to deliver logic and reason concerning the end times, just push it all to the side. How do we learn something new? We have to let go of something we, we believed. That's the only way to learn something new. You have to release something. There's a cost to walk in the new. One thing the Father told me, he said, this is what you must do with your life. You must always come to the Word and look out. Never take your idea to Scripture and try and prove it through Scripture. That's our problem. That's why our end-time theology is completely out. Of, it's just to we're totally lost because we're trying to prove it all. And if you find it all coming together, all nice and neatly and all nice and flowing, if the people, all the people haven't returned to the land, you've missed it because there's far too many demonstrations that these things are going to happen before the Messiah returns. There's too many. It's the kingdom. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Why is this important? Well, you know, some people say we're in the Shemitah year. They say we're moving into the Jubilee. <gasps> Quick, get all your money in Israel as quickly as possible. It's going to be the only bank system that survives. We're so caught up with the blood moons. We're so caught up with these systems. You know what? If the bride isn't ready, I don't care what signs are happening. I don't, it doesn't matter. Because the Father, oh, look, the signs happened. Everything's in place. Everything's in order. Oh, Messiah, you have to go back. Sorry they're not ready. Just go get that bunch of ragamuffins. And... No, He is coming for a bride that is spotless and blameless. That's what he's coming from. He's coming for a bride that is ready. Then we have the other question, who's the bride? Oh boy, here we go. 
Who's the bride? Is the bride a part of Israel? Is the bride the whole of Israel? I just have one question, one question only. Who did Yeshua marry at Sinai? Did he marry 15% of Israel? Did he marry 20% of Israel? Did he say, oh, Dan, I'm going to take 25 of you from there. I'm going to take 3,000 from over here. I'm going to take 450 from over there. <clears throat> There's my bride. It says in Jeremiah chapter 3, I divorced from Israel. But I didn't divorce from Judah. The question is, how much of Judah, how much of Israel did he marry? Anyone married here? Our spouses marry the whole of us. They don't like everything about us. <laughs> they find out things about us after we get married. <laughs> Too late, got the ring on. Well, I had to get mine cut off this week, actually. I was playing the jimbi the gym so much that it swelled my finger up. So anyway, I'll get that resized. Yeshua married the whole of Israel. Any teaching that teaches us any different. We can't make doctrines and we can't bring theology out of parables because parables are called to deliver a point, not to give us doctrine. The fact is if we can't marry it all up, we have a problem if we can't marry up. Well, what is the problem with this whole group of people who are meant to be the bride of Messiah? What is it with this body of Messiah? What is it with Israel? Because that's who the body is, Israel. Are they never going to get their act together? Have you ever read the book of Ephesians? There's the answer right there. The true gospel of the kingdom comes forth from the book of Ephesians powerfully. I'm going to make the two one. You who were formerly Gentiles... You are now part of the commonwealth of Israel. You are citizens of Israel. Hallelujah. And here comes the scripture that all the Christians like to quote when they're trying to beat you up and say, ah, you Hebrew roots people, you're just off your heads. In the whole section of chapter 2 where it's talking about united in one body, this is the key. We will witness this. Hallelujah. Why? Because the fivefold is not going to be like the American fivefold that we see that uh, wants to lord it over. Let's just pay everything up to the apostles. Let's get everything in line. Let's have this whole structure. No, there is a fivefold that is called by the Spirit in the book of Ephesians, and they're servant offices. They are offices that will serve, that will go out. We need the apostle. We need the prophets. We need the, the teachers. We need the evangelists. We need the pastors. We need these gifts to be in operation. Why? They will bring the body of Messiah to maturity. They will bring them to completeness. And guess what? We will be one. They'll also kick religion out of us. They'll challenge us on every side to make sure that we have no religion as part of our operations because that's what Yeshua said. Don't follow the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Don't follow their ways. We are not called to look like Jews, act like Jews. We're called to be who we are called to be in the freedom of Messiah. I tell people, I may as well tell it here, I tell it everywhere anyway. doesn't matter if I get myself in trouble, we can talk after. <laughs> I set up some counseling hotlines as well. We can do that. I tell people, just throw away your Torah portions. Don't throw away the Torah. Who told you there's a one-year cycle? Who told you there's a three-year cycle? Every investigation, every study I do, it is totally the tradition of man. I can't find it in the Bible. Yeshua, when he declared who he was, he had to go find the portion of Scripture. They're all shocked. They weren't expecting the delivery that he delivered in Nazareth. It's incredible. Of course, they're going to talk about things around the feast, but come on. What is, what is holding us back? We quench the spirits. Why? Because we don't seek the Father in the morning to say, Father, what are you doing today? How do I become a part of it? That's what Yeshua did. He said, I only do what I see the Father do. He didn't say, I only do what this week's Torah portion says to do and hoping that it lines up with the Father or the Father lines up with it. We're not f called to follow tradition. Now, I'm not against studying Torah. I am totally for studying Torah. I'm totally against us following in this cycle, trying to create this false unity. Why? We call it a midrash. I call it the middle rash, where everyone sits down together and starts going through the Torah portions. There's no room for the Spirit. I have seen it time and time again sitting in these groups. Someone has a word from the Spirit. They want to speak. The Scripture says you should all shut up and listen to the revelation that's coming forth. 
even if someone's preaching. Oh, we can't do that. We're trying to get through the Torah portion. We've only got another four hours. Can we talk about that after? Oh, we can't talk about it after because after we're done through four hours and we're trying to get our food down, we've got to go home because we're all worn out. Oh, let's not talk about anything spiritual. I'm exhausted. We just did four hours midrash. And we miss the work of the Spirit. We miss the life of the Spirit. We miss the transforming power of what the Ruach HaKodesh is trying to say to us to bring transformation. Are we seeing the lost supernaturally transformed around us? Are we seeing people being discipled around us? Are we? Because that's what Yeshua said. I, I want you, the Father wants you to bear fruit showing yourself to be my disciples. We should be seeing people multiply to us all the time because we have the greatest story ever told. The problem is we bring people to Torah out there, even in the restaurant today, just to, to release the anointed and ministered with pastors of mega churches in Abilene, Texas. It was incredible hearing the pastor at the end. He said, can I pray? Father, if what this guy is saying is true, then I am so far off base. Help me. And show me your truth. Churches are changing from Sunday to Sabbath. I'm not trying to get people out of the church. I'm saying, Father, turn that entire church around and have them change themselves from Sunday to Shabbat and come into Torah. Why? Let, you know, let the Father have all those buildings and let all that infrastructure be used for Hebraic roots. Why not? Yeah? not going to go pick one off here from the edge, one off there from the edge. No, we need to go in and say, wake up, oh sleeper. Your salvation is neither now than when you first believed. Oh, you think you have the full salvation right now, do you? It's amazing the conversations we have. It's amazing what happens in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, Therefore, remember, verse 11, that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done with the body by the hand of man. Remember that at that time you were separated from Messiah, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Covenants in plural, not singular of the promise, without hope and without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you once were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Messiah. For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two one. Hallelujah! Here we see the two becoming one. And have destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, or some scriptures say enmity, by abolishing in His flesh the law with its commands and regulations. All right, you Torah people, we got you. <laughs> now you can't tell people to go back to Torah because we just saw it all getting abolished right there. That's not what it says, is it? That's what it looks like it says in English. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, not, not Israel and the, the church coming together as one, but the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom thus making peace. See, isn't it powerful? Thus making peace. Where is peace going to come from? From the unity of us coming together as one. It's going to be radical. The testimony. Look what happened to Jericho when they heard that Israel was coming in. We are shaking in our boots because of the unity that you have with your God. We're shaking in our boots. So the enmity, the hostility, uh, what is being abolished? What's been abolished is, the, is the, the commandments and regulations concerning marriage. That's what's taking place here. I've heard different stories over this passage of Scripture where it's, oh, it's all about the hostility. No, it's about the marriage covenant, the, the, the commands and the regulations concerning the marriage. Hallelujah. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to Elohim through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Hallelujah. That enmity gets broken by the finished work of Messiah. He also separates from Judah because of his death. That's why the renewed covenant involves Judah and Israel together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So the key is, how do we minister? How do we share? Why are we seeing so many knockbacks? Are we experiencing knockbacks when we share our faith? If we are, then let's stop doing the things we're doing when we're messing it up. Because this nation's ripe on the harvest. I've been on most of the states of this country, traveling around this country. I get to LA, I've got nowhere to speak, so I take a little table, throw it on the beach, slap my Bible on the top with the iPhone, and invite people, come and have a seven-minute devotional. And I just hit the, the start and stop for seven minutes, and I just share a devotional on what the true gospel is. I see people weeping. I see people saying, I've never heard this gospel before. I see entire churches and congregations being transformed. How can this be? What on earth are they doing? Let me in there in the first place. <laughs> I don't go in to beat them up. I saw one pastor in Birmingham in England. He stood up before his whole congregation and he said, after hearing what I have just had, I just want to make an announcement to the entire church. He says, I am done with Christmas. As for me and my house, we are done with Christmas. He said, I can't tell you what to do, but I'm just telling you what the Spirit is saying to me. In Scotland, as I ministered the gospel of the kingdom, people came up. It, you know, when it said in Acts, 3,000 were added <coughs> in those Christian Sunday services in Scotland and Birmingham. I want to make an announcement. I saw those whole places being added. It was supernatural. They were coming up weeping, saying, I know what you are saying is truth. A 91-year-old woman, her ears opened up physically in the meeting, 91 years old. Everywhere I go, if we're sharing the gospel, pray for the sick. We prayed for the sick today. We prayed for the woman in the restaurant. Never let up an opportunity to minister to the sick when we're sharing the gospel because it's the sign of the gospel. It's the good news. Hallelujah. It's not just about hearing the right things and saying the right things. It's the demonstration of His reality. He is really real. He's alive. That's what charges us to witness and to reach out, is that He is alive. The 91-year-old woman said, not just not that my, my physical ears open up, she said, but my spiritual ears have opened up, and I'm going back to listen to the recording of this message over and over until it's burning in my spirit. We're seeing thousands of people being supernaturally transformed. We're seeing pastors wake up, changing their congregations. It's time. How are we reaching out? How do I reach out? What's the key in unlocking evangelism? Well, first, the key is this. We must be a people of prayer. It's not about have I learned enough to communicate the message. Listen, when you go out and speak to them, don't go out and don't, you know, look, any gardeners here, anyone like gardening? Anyone ever been in charge of a hose pipe over some plants? You don't stand there for three and a half hours like watering the same plant, do you? What's going to happen to the plant if you just keep standing there watering forever? It's going to die. When we're planting seed and when we're ministering the truth of the Word, let's not overdo it. When we're sharing with people, give them a little bit. Do you know the person you're speaking to is a, is a seeker of truth? I only speak to seekers of truth. I identify if they're a seeker of truth. Do you know how I identify if someone's a seeker of truth? I ask questions. I don't speak at people. I engage them in questions. I might say something like this, and some people have come up to me and said, did you say the word Jesus? I might say, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, Jesus, you said Jesus. <laughs> yes, I said Jesus, because that's all they know. Do you believe in Jesus? If they go, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then, then I might say, have you ever wondered why we don't do Christmas and Easter? If they go, I don't care. That's it. Well, nice to meet you. Have a good day. See ya. There's no, but if, if you say, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. He's awesome. You know that you've got a secret of truth. Have you ever wondered why Christmas and Easter is not in the Bible? And listen to what they say. Engage them in conversation. Deal with their doubts. Do you realize that over a million people are leaving the church and they're not leaving the church because they've lost their faith? They're leaving the church because they're fed up with the stand up, sit down, going through the motions week after week with no life. 
And they're leaving mega churches with the entertainment in the front. Why? Where is the answer? And the key to evangelism is not the script. What's the Ray Comfort and that? They have the little script in their books. And I was speaking to a gentleman just the other day. He said, I went home and I memorized the whole thing. So anytime I was on an airplane, anywhere I went, I had it so down. And I said, okay, we're going, to, we're going to evangelize today. Let me ask a question. What's the very first thing you're going to say to them? And then I listened to what he said. I'm like, oh, no, you're not. Not when you're coming out with me, you're not. <laughs> I said, because what you're doing is, basically what you're doing is you're insulting the person. Uh, can I ask you, how is your spiritual life? You don't even know them. How is your spiritual life? Some people don't even know what their spouse's spiritual life is like. <laughs> and they're eating dinner with them every day. What are the key things to say? How do we communicate? How do we keep things simple? If we simplify evangelism, we will see transformation. The fruit that I see in pastors and leaders and theologians as well as young people on the streets from every sector, from the old to the young, I'm seeing transformation. I go to the hotel and the bellman who's pulling my, my bags up to the room the father says at one o'clock in the morning, share with him the gospel, the true gospel. I'm like, oh, God, I've just been driving from Illinois. I'm in Virginia. I'm exhausted. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yes, I was a hard one. Man, it took me 40 years to say, to, to finally come to Jesus. I'm like, wow, 40 years. I said, have you ever heard the true gospel of the kingdom? <laughs> what do you mean the true gospel of the kingdom? What did he just say? He just told me he was a seeker of truth. What do you mean the true gospel? He's asking me a question. What do you mean? And then I was just able to share little things. You know, here we do. We go to Easter, Ishtar. Isn't it amazing that we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Messiah with the bare-breasted goddess of fertility? And you've got all these Easter bunnies and eggs running around. And I said, it says in the Bible that he will be the sign of Jonah three days and three nights. You do know that, don't you? Oh, of course I know that. Yeah, I read my Bible. I know exactly what it says there. Well, how do you get three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning? You can't. It's insanity. What about Christmas? You know, it's not even in the Bible, is it? We don't know when Jesus was born. That's what you were told, weren't you? Oh, yeah, that's what I was told. Well, we do know when he was born. <coughs> These little things, these simple things, start to open up their eyes. What are the key things we need to know? Another key thing we need to know, we need to understand how Protestants think. I used to stand up for many years before I speak, and I'd stand up and say this. Before I speak, I need you to know this. I am not a Catholic. And everyone would laugh, because there was no Catholics there. Well, maybe a few ex-Catholics. And then I said, I'm not a Protestant. The whole place goes quiet. And I said, because a Protestant is a Protestant Catholic, and I just told you I'm no Catholic. I'm a believer in the Messiah. I said that for years, going through churches on television and everywhere. I saw, I'm like, do I have to say that again? It got to the stage where I didn't even need a word to say it. I just got up and said it. I'm no Catholic. The Pope is the vicar of Christ reigning in the millennial kingdom. Do we know that? He's already in the millennial how long is the millennial? Well, it can be as long as it wants to be. <laughs> the Pope is the vicar of Christ reigning in the millennial. I tell people when I share with them, the whole reason Protestant non-denominational churches say it's all fulfilled in Jesus is because the Pope is the vicar of Christ reigning in the millennial kingdom, and they've already declared that everything is fulfilled. Because that's where they're living. It's all fulfilled. But I say to them, but you don't believe it's all fulfilled, do you? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all fulfilled. The law's all fulfilled. Well, don't you believe in the second coming? If it's all fulfilled and you're waiting for the second coming, then maybe it's not fulfilled. Do you think the whole book of Revelation has been fulfilled? So what we do is we start hitting them with their doubts. <clears throat> One I use with pastors that's very good to take note of from Matthew chapter 5 when they say that the, the law is fulfilled. It's all fulfilled. I said, it actually says the law and the prophets. Now, if the prophets are all fulfilled, where is your covenant for salvation? You can't even get saved. 
You have no definition of sin if the Torah is fulfilled. You have no covenant for salvation if the prophets are fulfilled. I've never heard a Christian pastor say that the prophets are fulfilled. They might tell you the law is fulfilled. We're under grace. Then the next question you ask them is, who told you that you have to make a choice between law and grace? Can you show me in the Bible where it says make a choice, law or grace? If I have a magnum in this hand, and I have an ice lolly in this hand that's just frozen water or a little bit of fruit, and I say to you, what do you want, magnum or just frozen juice? What do you want? I want the magnum. Well, of course I'm going to choose grace. If I had to make a choice between law or grace, I'm going to choose grace, of course. But grace doesn't take away the Torah. So Matthew chapter 5 is a key area that we have to understand and, and use. And my comforting word to Christians, especially to leaders, when they are challenged at the things we're saying, if the message that we are walking in is truly true, man, they feel so insecure. I had my father sit down and say to me one day, he says, Kenny, if everything you're saying is true, then my entire ministry for 40 years was in vain. I said, no. I said, if everything I've said is true and you accept it, then you are more connected to Yahovah, to God, than you are connected to your denomination. Because the reality that we are in Him is that we have the ability to change when He speaks to us. Why didn't he show us this all these years ago? Why didn't he? I said to the Father, why didn't you tell me 20 years ago? I would have followed. I've been sold out all my life to you for the purpose of the kingdom. Why didn't you tell me? He said it wasn't the time. This is the time. So when we evangelize, the first thing we must be involved in is prayer. <coughs> we must pray. Are we meeting to pray for the lost? Are we meeting to ask the Father where the people are that are ripe unto harvest? Do we spend time every day reaching out to people? It's our responsibility. We have the life. We have the truth. This is good news. There's a passage in Isaiah that talks about the watchman. Or is it Ezekiel? I think it's Ezekiel. You see, the, you see what's coming and you say nothing. It will be on your shoulders for keeping your mouth shut. We are called to be what? Ambassadors. We are servants of the Most High. It's not our opinion. It's not our life. It's not our way. We don't have Yeshua in our backpack. We're called to have him in our hearts. He says, put the Torah in your minds and in your hearts. We're called to walk with him in the Spirit. I truly believe that tonight's purpose is for us to be unlocked, to wake up. Now, how many of you are involved in evangelism right now who daily are communicating? One. How many more? A few. Okay. Let me ask a question. When you're sharing, what type of feedback do you get, sir? I need to quote better. Okay. How many people have been transformed and are walking with you since all your time witnessing? Okay. Right. Okay. Right. When you say messianics, you mean uh, uh, messianics in synagogues, or you mean like Christians, or? Uh, I mean, um, Hebrews, Nezer, Kaltari, uh, sacred neighbors. Okay. All right. All right. Well, what I'd say to you, if you're continually coming up against the wall, up against the wall, there's, there's, there's two things we have to do. We either have to address what we are saying and how we're saying it. When I first came into Torah, everyone came against me, right? But I wasn't a Torah terrorist. We must not be Torah terrorists, okay? We must know how to communicate. But in the ability to communicate, we have to know when to stop unless the Ruach says you don't stop, okay? But we have to know the balance of how to communicate. Sorry, what do you want to say? Okay, all right. All right, so as I witness, as I share, 
like I said, I'm only speaking to people who are seekers of truth. If they're hard-hearted, you can't break through to them. So the only thing you can do is you can just make a, a pray for them, say things to identify if there's openings for communication. Because if their whole focus is just to argue with you and, and, and weigh you against their opinion, against your, your thoughts, then that is called a sucker. All right, those branches in a plant need to be cut off. What do we invest in? We invest in people and in places that will bear fruit, uh, who have eyes to see. And if we're zealous and we go out and we keep flogging a dead horse and we're not getting through, you look at what happened to Yeshua. They didn't listen to him. They kick him out, to the, out of the synagogues. He takes the gospel of the kingdom onto the streets. And he says the prostitutes and the tax collectors are entering the kingdom of Yehovah faster and greater than you Pharisees. So the key is if we spend all of our time just trying to deliver knowledge and trying to say, listen, you need to wake up. Don't even waste your time. You know why? When you go out and you start bringing transformation into people around you, they're going to wake up and say, wait a second. What are they doing that's different? What's happening in their realm? Look how many people are being added. Look at the life that's coming forth from there. And the other key is this. If you bring someone to a place and revelation of coming back to Torah, if you can't take them to your Torah group in fear that they'll be so put off because of the style and the function of your Torah group, then, then we need to change. Because if you think it's embarrassing just to bring someone in the street into our, our Torah service, then come on. Let, let's change things. And I'm not talking about being seeker-friendly. <laughs> Don't get me wrong in any way, any shape. But what we're not called to do is we're not called to function in religion. This is life. The disciples met around the table. They broke bread. They drank the wine. They fellowshiped together. They ministered together. They shared testimony. They shared the Torah together. They flowed together. But if things go on and on and on, it's too deep and it's all this... <sighs> We, we don't have the environment to bring them. We have to create the environment where we can bring people so they can grow truly into the Torah. And that's why we're seeing literally hundreds of young people come into Torah, and they're not hanging around all those Torah groups in their area. But what's happening is those families that have been 10 years on their own trying to keep the world out because they're trying to make sure they keep their families in Torah, they're finding all these young people that are zealous for Torah, that are making a difference. And you know what? They, they stepped out of their comfort zone. Many families, I interviewed them. You can see some of the testimonies of some of them on uh, Bulldoze of Faith on YouTube. And they actually stepped out. The people that have been in Torah for 10 years. One of them, he says, he says, oh, my neighbor was in Torah for 10 years. And I didn't hear or accept Torah through them. I thought they were crazy. I thought they were off their heads. But when I found Torah, he says, now my neighbor, they have now come and joined with our group. And they've just had to get delivered from religion and just get a little free and become who the Father's called them to be. You know, we can't have people coming into Torah and then binding them up with a spirit of religion so they don't relate. Yeshua related as he communicated. He related to the people of his, of his day. The wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here.